All right, everyone. Welcome to the University of Arkansas Muscadine webinar. We're really excited to have you here today. My name is Amanda McWhort. I'm a horticulture extension specialist working on fruits and vegetables here at the University of Arkansas. And I'm going to be one of your co-hosts tonight. And I'm joined by Dr. Renee Thralpal. Hi. Renee, thank you so much for joining us. Hi. Um, I am a research scientist at the University of Arkansas, located in the Food Science Department, and my specialty is Enology and Viticulture Research. Great, so we're looking forward to a lot of good topics tonight. Um, you know, we know it's a very busy time of year for most of our muscadine growers. I know, Renee, you've been very busy uh, working with your students, collecting data over the last couple of days. Um, but hopefully some of you are, are coming in out of the fields and taking a little break and joining us here tonight. Um, and so we're going to get to know you all a little bit better and we appreciate you participating in the poll. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the results of that and share who um, is here with us here in a second. But Renee, what have you been seeing so far um, being out in the muscadine fields? So we're having a, a pretty good harvest. Everything's running a little late this year, it seems. So um, I know that a lot of the growers in Arkansas were impacted by that late freeze we had in April. Um, I think muscadines uh, were impacted a teeny bit with that, um, but not as much as the, the, the other uh, grapes that we grow here in the state. But we're seeing lots of, uh, this. I was telling the other people who are on the panel today that this is the peak week. In fact, for me, this is peak day. We've got muscadines for research coming in from Arkansas, from the fruit station, from North Carolina. Uh, so it's busy muscadine season. So I'm glad that everyone was able to maybe take a little time and learn a little bit about what we're doing here in Arkansas. Right, right. Well, so it looks like from our polls that um, about 36% of you are muscadine growers, 7% uh, are muscadine processors, 14% are extension personnel, and about 43% are just interested in muscadines. So hopefully we'll help give you some good information if you're just interested in, in starting to grow muscadines. And I see that some of, not very many of you are m members of the Arkansas Association of Grape Growers. We're co-hosting this meeting. I've been on the board for quite a while and um, it's a pretty great organization if you're learning about growing grapes in Arkansas. The networking is pretty nice for that. So I encourage you to look us up on our website and, and find out more about, it, about us. Yeah, absolutely. And we appreciate the support from the Arkansas uh, Association of Grape Growers to help put on this webinar. Uh, the webinar was also sponsored by the Arkansas SARE program. So why don't we go ahead and, and jump in. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the speakers that you're gonna hear from tonight. Our first speaker is Dr. Margaret Worthington and she is the leader of the Muscadine Breeding Program here at the University of Arkansas. And she's gonna give us some updates on that program uh, and the advancements in and working on seedless muscadines. Then we have a special guest from North Carolina State University. Dr. Mark Hoffman is their strawberry and muscadine specialist. Uh, he worked uh, with some specialists from all around the region to put together a new muscadine production guide. And he's going to give us some insights on that guide. And, and it's a really great resource if you've never looked at it before. And then we'll go, come back here to Arkansas and hear from Dr. Aaron Cato, who's our uh, IPM specialist. Uh, working on fruits and vegetables here in the state and he's going to talk about some pest management recommendations for muscadines and then we'll wrap things up with a short tour of rusty tractor uh, vineyards here in little rock and a short interview with riley mason so we're looking for, forward to a lot of great information here tonight and the format's a little different i know a lot of you miss going to the fruit research station and being in the vines and seeing all the new and interesting stuff we're doing at the university of arkansas and we hope hope that next year we'll be able to do this in person but so it's a little different format um, we're going to watch some recordings but we're going to be on live at the end to answer questions so hang in there and and we'll be able to have some more discussions we have to say special thank you to our sponsors the arkansas association of grape growers and um, the arkansas SARE for making this happen i do want to also mention the cooperative extension service and mary polling because these webinars are, are more complicated than they appear and they run smoothly and great only because people work on them in advance quite a bit. So I hope that we can uh, get started with our video and we're going to watch um, the, uh, some of the information for these speakers. Thank you very much for having me. My name is Margaret Worthington, and I am a fruit breeder with the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture Fruit Breeding Program. 
So I'm going to talk a little bit about an update of our new muscadine grape breeding program here today. Many of you are probably familiar with our other breeding programs here, uh, primarily our blackberry breeding program, which has been our most commercially successful, and also our table grape breeding program. So the University of Arkansas System uh, started its fruit breeding program back in 1964, and we had a number of different crops that we worked on. And one of those from the very beginning was table grapes. So our founder, Dr. James Moore, had a vision for building an Eastern table grape industry. And he would do this by combining the excellent flavor that you get from Eastern grapes like Concord grapes with that improved texture that you see in something like a Thompson seedless, in addition to adaptation to our region and its climatic challenges. Um, however, it's been hard to actually achieve that vision, unlike some of the other visions that Dr. Moore had for the program, just because with our climate and the rots and diseases that we see with our summer rains, it's very hard to compete with California on table grape production. So products that we've had from our grape breeding program have been successful, but they mostly are successful in California <laughs> where they're grown. Um, so we shifted focus about around the early 2000s to building an Eastern table grape industry a different way through the table grape that we already have that's adapted to this region. And that is of course the fabulous muscadine grape. Um, we've learned some lessons from our table grape breeding program that we bring into the muscadine breeding program here. Uh, one of the most famous and successful products of Arkansas breeding has been cotton candy grape. This is something that was bred by IFG, a private company, but using the source of the flavor as an Arkansas parent. So um, that fruity flavor is something that people didn't think that people wanted like a highly flavored, weird tasting grape. They thought people always wanted neutral flavored grapes, but that is quite wrong. Actually, people were really excited by this flavor. Um, it's different from the other full flavored grapes that we see because it has thin skins, it's crisp and it's seedless. And so it feels in your mouth like a California table grape, but it comes with this great new flavor. And so it's been really successful and people are excited. And we kind of have a similar vision with muscadines. If we can make that full flavor come in that people really like about muscadines and combine that with a texture that is more familiar to a broader range of consumers, then maybe we can have a hit product and a new industry for our state and our region. So our muscadine breeding program has been ongoing since 2007. That's when John Clark made the first crosses to start the program. Since then, we have planted over 19,000 seedlings at the Fruit Research Station, and we have gone through those seedlings every year, and we've made selections. And um, as of today, we have made 274 selections in our program, five so far this year in 2020. So we have a group of advanced selections that are moving along. And as I said, we are focused on improving that consumer quality while maintaining that disease resistance, adaptation, and the flavor that people like about muscadine grapes. Our ultimate goal is to make muscadines an inside fruit. So I kind of steal Dr. Clark's joke here, but we've been talking about this for a long time. The muscadines are a fun fruit and delicious, but they're not very sophisticated sometimes because they involve a lot of spitting. Uh, you can imagine yourself out on this porch here with your little spittoon, because uh, a lot of people will spit out the skins and then they'll also spit out the seeds. I personally eat my muscadine skins. I grew up in Eastern North Carolina, and so muscadines have been part of my diet from an early age, and they are my number one favorite fruit. But, um, a lot of times the skin can be very tough or leathery. Uh, it has been compared to like shoe leather. <laughs> uh, people who like often will not eat it. Also the flesh texture can be off. I've heard it described as having like an eyeball texture or an oyster texture. Well, that's not very appealing. They won't fly off the shelves with that. So we want them to have a thinner skin that is easily broken up when you're chewing and a thicker, more crisp flesh like you would see in a table grape. In addition, people don't like those seeds. They are very large and they are very bitter. So I often bite into them when I'm evaluating muscadines and I am not a fan either. However, 
seedlessness has been achieved. There have been a lot of efforts to develop seedlessness over the years, um, but the most successful endeavor so far by far has been by Jeff Bloodworth, a private breeder in North Carolina, and most recently his program has been acquired by Gardens Alive. What he did to achieve seedlessness is just cross wide hybrids between muscadines and bunch grapes to bring that seedless gene in. Well, I guess a muscadine is a little bit like a donkey and a grape is a little bit like a horse. And so when you cross them together, you end up with a lot of mules that are sterile. But fortunately, muscadines make a lot more babies than mules. So we have opportunities for a few things that actually restore that fertility to come back. So he has been able successfully through just effort and sheer volume of crosses and persistence to make this happen over the course of a 30 year career. And so we fortunately struck an agreement between the University of Arkansas and his private program that has now been acquired by Gardens Alive to cross with his material. So we made our first crosses with Jeff Bloodworth's seedless material in 2017 and Drum roll. Uh, behold, we made our first seedless selection on Sunday of last week. So this is AM270S, the first seedless selection from the University of Arkansas. As you can see, it was selected first by some birds that decided to build a nest in it. And then by me next last week when I saw it was the only seedless <laughs> uh, vine in our whole crosses that we grew from 2017. But it looks really good so far. It's tasty. Uh, fruit is about the size of Carlos, so a little small, but we expect smaller to come with seedlessness at first. Um, so we're off to an exciting start. We've been crossing with the seedless material every year since 2017, and I expect that we'll have even more great products coming down in the future. Although, of course, it's usually about seven years from making that first selection to making a product. Uh, when you are doing a breeding program, it's a real long-term endeavor. So this is not to say that 270S will be out and available on the market anytime soon, but we're on our way. There are some other exciting things about crossing with the seedless material that I want to mention, I think that are really great for our program. Along with seedlessness, we're bringing in some new colors like bright red, uh, some new textures. Jeff has some really interesting stuff with improved texture coming from the bunch grapes. Um, some new flavors, some that are much more neutral than muscadines and some that are have that traditional muscadine flavor and a lot of much needed diversity. Uh, so I just want to highlight here um, you can see a lot of the original muscadines that have been the founders of our modern breeding programs are all coming from eastern North Carolina. Um, so although muscadines are native to our region, there isn't actually a lot of diversity that we're working with in breeding programs. This is also demonstrated, this is a pedigree I put together for a paper that I had on uh, genetic mapping. You can see, although we had like multiple different final selections here at the bottom, the, the family tree doesn't fork very much. <laughs> There's a lot of the same original founders that are just being crossed together over and over again. And this has resulted in some reduced vigor in our program. So we think that we'll have better vine health and hardiness by increasing the diversity that we're using in our breeding programs. As I said, the flavor, I think there's a real strength of muscadines. They are real aromatic and flavorful. I love the way my car smells when I bring back uh, <laughs> several boxes of muscadines from Clarksville to Fayetteville. We think that this is gonna be a hit in the market and we are excited with some of the variations that we see within muscadine flavor too. Some new selections have been seen that have a real rosy flavor, extreme floral flavor, or also these tropical pineapple, coconut type flavors. So there's some diversity that we're working in within these muscadine flavor profiles as well. We also are focused on breeding for cold hardiness. So here you can see a map of the native range of muscadines in this gray area. And then uh, here in green are where some of the other major breeding programs around the south are for muscadine grapes. And here you can see our main breeding site in Clarksville, Arkansas in red, and our secondary sites in Fayetteville and in Hope in yellow. 
So we have a site in Hope that is firmly within the range muscadines are adapted, a site in Fayetteville that is a stretch to get muscadines to survive, and Clarksville is right here at this borderline. So it's a really nice environment to select for cold hardiness. We see cold damage in Clarksville every once in a while. This past year we had really temperatures within the normal range for muscadines to survive without damage, but we've had some very cold years 2017, 2018 was a very cold year. Here are some of the symptoms that we see. You'll get these kind of breaks in the vascular system and then leakage. And so the sugar water leaks out and we get this kind of orange algae slime that leaks out the side. We get these aerial roots that show up because of this damage to the vascular system where the plant's just looking to find some ground to suck itself into again. Um, and then uh, finally, we get a lot of damage to the cordons, to the spurs, and even whole vines can be killed by the cold damage. So I'll note that in bunch grapes, usually when you get cold damage, it's due to damage to the buds themselves. However, the buds will super cool during the winter to the same level that the bunch grapes will. So muscadines actually have cold hardy buds, but they just don't winterize themselves. It's like an irrigation system where somebody doesn't bother to flush it out and that water will come in and out through the vascular system. And during those freeze thaw cycles that we see, they, they get a lot of extreme damage. We see a range of differences in the phenotypes for cold hardiness, things like Supreme and Black Beauty usually get hit really hard for us. Other things a little intermediate like this Nesbitt and Carlos is one that really does well for us every year. Carlos and Noble, the um, processing type muscadines are generally some of the most cold hardy that we have. There are implications for productivity every year. These vines, the Carlos vines, just stay strong, whereas other vines, even later in the season, they don't ever catch up, and they are just left more susceptible to all the various things that can happen to them throughout the rest of the year. Some other breeding objectives that we have, we're really interested in different shapes. Here you can see a handful of all the different shapes we're working with. We've bred bunch grapes to be all kinds of long, silly shapes like witch fingers. And so we think we can do some things and make a football shaped muscadine just in time for the fall. Um, we are interested in dry stem scar for post harvest storage ability. So here you can see a real wet scar. So we breed for that. Here we're breeding for increased cluster size so that you could actually potentially pick a muscadine as a cluster instead of berry by berry in the future. Uh, and we have some variation in leaf shape. This is a fun leaf shape that is coming from the southern home um, variety. And we hope that um, we can develop some pretty muscadines that can be nice for homeowners to grow for ornamental as well as eating purposes. Uh, muscadines are of course very disease resistant, but we do see different diseases. Um, not as big a problem as in bunch grapes, but we'll see black rot on the leaves and fruit that we watch for, for bitter rot, macrophoma rot, and ripe rot. So we'll see all of these and we maintain, you know, a very minimal spray program at um, fruit research stations so that we can catch different diseases. This year, we actually have seen a disease that I haven't seen that much in the past. This is the first year that I've seen a lot of powdery mildew on muscadines. It's been super rainy recently. Uh, and this is kind of what you'll see on a muscadine. It just gets this kind of cobwebby appearance um, on the muscadine. I don't see a ton of fruit cracking with it. It's mostly a cosmetic thing for us. Here you can see powdery mildew on grapes and how devastating it can be there. So this is the symptom that you see on powdery mildew versus you know, whole clusters just rotting on grapes. So we're also interested in processing uh, cultivars. For processing cultivars as opposed to fresh market are real interested in productivity and consistent uh, ripening. So all ripening at the same stage, whereas for a fresh market type, you might want it to ripen over the course of the season. For a processing type, you want them all to ripen at the same time and come off. Dry scar, stable color, cold hardiness, disease resistance. And of course, we're evaluating the products. So we've been working with Dr. Renee Threlfall in the food science department to harvest Noble and our advanced selection AM77 and make wine and juice 
to see if AM77 has some advantages that Noble does not have. And this advanced selection is also in testing with Post and with uh, growers in Texas, Georgia, and in North Carolina right now. In 2020, we have had some new challenges that I have not experienced before. Uh, primarily, we have been struggling with oxen herbicide injury at Brute Research Station. So I think we'll probably lose about 20% of the vines on our farm this year because of this oxen injury that we're receiving from drift. Uh, here you can see some of the symptoms, um, the leaves, some weird growth there, some reductions in plant vigor that will probably result in the death of this vine next year. And a new thing I haven't seen before in muscadines, hens and chickens, where we have some fruit that is ready to harvest, uh, and then some others that is not anywhere close and won't make it. <laughs> so really delayed weird ripening. So when is the first release coming? The answer is soon. Uh, we put five advanced selections into virus testing at the National Clean Plant Network Center in Raleigh, North Carolina last year. And our hope is that these guys will be certified virus free and that we would have fresh market and processing releases available to make as soon as next fall. So that's the idea. So good things coming from the University of Arkansas fruit breeding program. So with that, I will end my presentation and take any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much and, and welcome. Um, today, I would like to introduce the new Muscadine production guide for the Southeast. That's a new product which came out this year, um, in January this year, 2020. Uh, my name is Mark Hoffman. I am the Small Fruits Extension Specialist at NC State University. And uh, in the next 10 minutes, we're going to talk about what's in the new Muscadine Production Guide, why we do have a new Muscadine Production Guide, and how can you get it. Um, so first, why do we need a new Production Guide? There is a lot of reasons for that. The last Production Guide, which was published, a uh, comprehensive Production Guide, which was published, in our area in North Carolina was from 2003. Um, and since 2003, in between 2003 and now, a lot of things changed. A lot of new cultivars are out now. Um, we have a very growing industry, a lot, the industry grew a lot between 2003 and 2020 in our area here. And um, we also have a growing base of homeowners in North Carolina and in the rest of the Southeast. Um, in numbers, um, North Carolina is uh, number one in terms of commercial acreage. We have about 1,200 acres of commercial muscadine production, fresh market and wine production. The fresh market uh, sector is growing a lot in North Carolina at the moment. Uh, we also have the largest uh, winery at the East Coast, which is a muscadine winery, produces way more than 500,000 cases uh, per year. Um, a muscadine wine, in total we produce more than a million cases in North Carolina, but more than half of that is muscadine wine. And then um, also North Carolina in the southeast is uh, number two in population growth. Uh, we have an influx of 2.2% people, at least in 2018, that was the case. So we have a lot of people coming from somewhere else. They don't know muscadines, but they probably do want to grow muscadines. So. So we had a lot of reasons why we want to put, put together a new muscadine production guide. And um, this was one of the first time when it was really a joint collaborative effort between uh, two universities, NC State University and University of Georgia. And um, it was a collaborative effort between uh, several authors. We had Patrick Connor from UGA, who is a plant breeder. He authored a chapter, Philip Brennan, who is a disease specialist at UGA. He, chaptered, uh, 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 he authored a chapter as well. And then we had uh, several specialists from NC State, Bill Klein, Hannah Burrock, Wayne Mitchum, uh, and myself. And uh, we also had Penny Perkins, who is a scientist, a food quality scientist who works a lot on muscadines, authoring a chapter. And Barclay Poling was contributing a lot to this whole um, uh, book as well. 
I am the main editor of this book. So I wrote the first text body and then I also edited through all iterations until it was published. And Kane Hickey from UGA, now Pennsylvania State, and Hannah Burak from NC State were my co-editors. And we also had a grower editorial, which uh, were three growers from here from North Carolina, uh, from uh, Irvin Leinberger from Killer Fines, and with Jones from Cottle Farms, both fresh market um, growers, and then William Jost, who is a wine producer. Um, so what's in it? Uh, we have 17 chapters. Uh, they are pretty condensed on 32 pages. It's all in color, and we have uh, a updated resource list of for for up for resources through three states: South Carolina, North Carolina, and Georgia. And we also have a updated map, which you can see here in the upper right corner, of potential muscadine growing regions. And uh, if we look at the content, we, as I said, we have 17 chapters. We're uh, talking about cultivars. We have a chapter on costs, estimates for the first three years of establishment. We have uh, chapters on training, on trellising, and pruning muscadines. We have a site selection chapter. We have a chapter on climate change as well. We have, uh, which covers hurricanes and other things. And then we have a chapter on fertility and propagation, and of course, weed, pest, and disease management, all with pictures. And um, that is, I'm gonna give you some examples. So for, for example, this is like the updated cultivar list um, that's very uh, phrased to the Southeast, so especially to Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina. Um, but you can see he, here we have color, fruit size, we have a cold hardiness scale, and we also look at when do those wines bear the most fruit. Um, another example, this is how a page looks like. We have two columns, it's very easy to read, and we do have uh, cost uh, chapters for, cost estimates for the years uh, one, two, and three. Um, this is how you get it. It's uh, under grapes.csncsu2020 new muscadine production guide. You can just click on this link here and then you can uh, get there. Or you Google it and you find it too. Um, and there's also a limited amount of print versions available for agents and specialists. If some agents do want to have a printed version, a color printed version, please contact me or please contact other agents who might be also interested. I'm happy to ship a bunch of copies to your extension office. And then uh, also uh, general terms, you can visit, we also have webinars online, and uh, you can also visit our portal. You will always find new information on muscadines uh, under our webinars for this year, and also under our portal. And the support for this uh, was from the Southern Small Fruits Consortium. And uh, with that, Thank you all for your attention, and um, I hope I can take some questions in the Q&A later. Thanks. I'm Aaron Cato. I'm the Extension Horticulture IPM Specialist for the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture. So basically, I work in fruits, vegetables, and pecans, and I do pest management within those. And today, I'm going to talk about pest management and muscadine. So for pest management in muscadines, we really want to use an integrated approach, which means using a combination of tactics such as cultural control, mechanical or physical control, biological and chemical control to manage pests, not to exterminate or eradicate pests, but try to manage pests in a way that's economically viable, right? You want to be efficient in how you're using different pest management tactics to make sure that you're maximizing the amount of money you're making and also minimizing the amount of impact you're having on both the environment and uh, the people that live around your vineyard. And you can apply uh, most of the things I'll talk about today to diseases, to insects, and to weed management. Um, a lot of the stuff I talk about will be front-end loaded, so cultural control or augmenting the environment of your vineyard uh, to try to prevent issues from being too bad or from, uh, for having too much of an effect on the plant. So let's talk about some general cultural control. And so just to reiterate, when I talk about cultural control, I'm talking about modifying the growing environment to reduce the prevalence or impact of pests. And so the first way you can do that is site selection. And I recognize that many of the people that are listening to this 
already have muscadines out there, but um, there's a lot of things you can do before you go into muscadines as well. So if you're thinking about planting more acres of muscadines or starting a new uh, muscadine vineyard, then these are things you should consider. Uh, elevated sites are going to dry more quickly. Uh, we know that fog settles in lower areas. This means that the plants will stay wet for longer periods of time. And that means that you're gonna have, have a higher risk of infection for many diseases because they, a lot of times need wet leaves or wet plant materials to actually infect, affect plants. East facing slopes are gonna dry more quickly. You have the sun that comes up and face, uh, it's gonna face right to it. So it's gonna burn the dew that settle on those plants off more quickly. You wanna make sure you have good draining soils uh, or the location itself needs to drain very well. Um, we know that if plants have wet feet or if they set in uh, um, a lot of water, that means they're gonna maximize or gonna have more uh, disease issues. So really what you can do is like a perk test down to about 24 to 30 inches in depth. Um, and so if it, if it drains pretty well at that depth, you know that you're not gonna have too many issues there. Highly fertile soils are not desirable. I mean, you can make a lot of things work, uh, but if it's very fertile soil, you'll end up with a lot of growth, um, which is generally going to mean decreased amount of airflow, which means you're going to have more um, of that wet leaf material sticking around. And also, it's probably going to mean more weeds. You know, if you have a lot of very a soil that's going to promote growth of plants, it's going to make, mean a lot more fighting with weeds. And also, just surrounding tree lines are going to increase some pests, and especially when we're talking about insects. You know, that you have some kind of a refuge for them to fly directly off of. It means you can have a lot of things, especially on the edge of your vineyards, where they're coming in to feed. And that's especially important when we're talking about grapeberry moths, because they do need these trees nearby as refuge to come into your plantings. Once you have a site, you know, you really want to try to develop it to where you're promoting air movement and maximizing the amount of drainage. And a lot of times when we're talking about promoting air movement just for site development, we're talking about is making sure you have no hedgerows that are blocking the winds from blowing in uh, through the, the rows within your vineyard because that's just going to decrease airflow, make it more stagnant and more disease ridden. So a lot you can do with plant selection as well, right? Um, we know that if you buy vines from sources that aren't very reputable, a lot of times they are laden with uh, plant viruses. So make sure you're going to a reputable source, something that's an industry standard, um, so that they are more or less likely to have some of these plant viruses present. You also want to choose varieties for your area and for your market. Make sure those varieties have been grown in a similar um, zone to you, and so you're not going to have too much damage uh, from maybe things like frost being too early. But also for the market, you know, processing varieties aren't going to do very well. They're going to have a lot more disease issues than if you're trying to pick them for fresh market uh, selling. So make sure you understand your, your market before you decide on a, um, the variety that you're picking. You want to make sure that your plants are healthy. And so stress vines will be more affected by disease, they'll be more affected by insects, and they'll also not be able to compete as well with weeds that are around the, uh, your plants. And so making sure that you have proper fertility, you irrigate correctly and not use the right amount of water and other production practices is gonna mean that your plants are gonna be less stressed and you're gonna have um, maybe less disease or maybe just more yield compared to if they weren't as stressed. And some of these uh, issues with like insects and disease could be a lot worse. So let's go into weed management first, just for our specific uh, pests that we're gonna talk about. So elimination of weeds is part of site preparation. So I didn't mention it in the cultural process before, but you never want to plant into an area where you already have weeds present, especially when we're talking about perennial weeds like Bermuda grass or Johnson grass or Dallas grass, things like that. These are all weeds that are gonna be very difficult to get rid of on their own. And so if you can use something like glyphosate or Roundup uh, multiple times to get rid of these things before you plant, then it's gonna give you or pay a lot of dividends into the future. Once you do have your um, vines planted, you want to maintain a three to four foot wide weed free strip under the vines. This is going to minimize competition for water and nutrients between those weeds and the vines themselves. And it's also going to promote airflow so that the air can flow underneath the vines where the fruit are going to be hanging down. Generally, you want to um, rely on a weed management program every single year. And so there'll be different times throughout the year where you want to use herbicides or tillage. Um, most of your removal and the strip of uh, weeds are gonna be through tillage or hoeing, uh, but you can also use post-emergent herbicides. And the big thing to remember is that whenever you use anything to remove weeds in a uh, weed-free strip, you always want to follow that immediately with a pre-emergent herbicide. And so if you disturb the soil at all, then you are promoting the germination of new weed seeds, right? And so if you go through and even hoe, which you'll see is if you get a rainfall right after that, 
you'll see new weeds pop up right where you hoed at. And so if you disturb the soil, then you need to come and follow that with a pre-emergent herbicide. And so if you spray a pre-emergent herbicide and then hoe the same day right afterwards, it's not gonna do you any good. Um, if you do put out just a post-emergent herbicide to try to get rid of some of the weeds that are there, you can uh, likely just combine those. And so as long as you're just covering the soil and not disturbing it, you will get good activity with that pre-emergent herbicide. Um, the big thing, another thing to think about is don't contact the vines with systemic herbicides. And so there's a lot of things that um, you'll read that are safe to use around grapes, but a lot of them come with the caveat that you don't need to contact the vines. And really most important are any kind of uh, the um, stem structures that are especially the green material where it can really flow into the plant. But just making sure you don't contact it at all would be with any kind of systemic herbicide would be ideal. I'm not gonna to talk too much about um, the timings and the, the products to use. Um, really what you should do is go to the 2019 Southeast Regional Muscadine Grape Integrated Management Guide. Um, this is gonna have a lot of information as you see here, where it will have success at herbicide programs. What I would do is go check all of these products for the state and so make sure they are labeled in Arkansas. And usually if you say Google flumioxazin and you find the, um, the person who sells flumioxazin or makes it, they'll list whether or not it's labeled in each state. Um, but if you can also, if you can buy it within the state and get the label within the state, then a lot of times it will be. But I know a lot of uh, growers will buy things off of uh, Amazon or they'll buy things through um, other states. And so there you don't always have an indication whether or not it's labeled in the state. But um, I would always double check that because it is gonna be on you if it's not labeled in the state. What you'll also see in this uh, management guide are um, different weeds that you may have and then the other products and then their efficacy there and so um, whenever we talk about an integrated approach we always harp on identification of the pest and so if you can get what you got uh, id'd then a lot of times you can find a good product that's going to control that but even there what you'll see is um, some of these products they're just going to be really good on all grasses or all broad leaves and some are just going to have general control on all the ones like a good one to look at would be something like clethodim right it has excellent control on all of your annual grasses and it has no control on anything else. And so a lot of these products will kind of fall into a bracket of, well, I, that's a grass, I find out it's an annual grass and you can get a good idea of what to control, control it with. The next thing let's talk about is disease management. And this is really um, the most important thing that you'll be doing um, out in your uh, vineyard. And you've already noticed that everything I've talked about so far is a lot to do with trying to minimize the infection from diseases or minimize the amount of time the plants are wet. And cultural control is just very important for that. But um, site maintenance and drainage is gonna be part of that and especially weed management to increase airflow. Another thing to talk about is pruning and decreasing inoculum in the field, which is a lot of times gonna be done in the dormancy period. You want to remove all dead and diseased wood. If you have dead and diseased wood, this is going to um, have inoculum or spores from different diseases that are inside of it, and this can then move to other plants. You want to remove all old fruit or clusters from the field. So these are once again, a lot of times diseased in themselves, and they will spread inoculum in the next year. It can move from these old fruit or clusters to your new growing tips and then affect the plant that way, or, or start to increase in the amount of spores that are uh, being produced that year. Replace cordons that have wounds. Um, these are entry points for disease. And so if, say you have a cordon that's growing around a wire. Um, I know this is a lot, a lot to think about in a very old planting, but um, you know, start thinking about how you can start try to replace some things because these are gonna create problems down the line, especially when you have things like frost injury, something like that. Follow your pruning cuts with fungicide applications. And so uh, one thing that I heard about in the NC State uh, webinar that I just really had recently was to aim for two big pruning events and then follow those with a fungicide applications. And so that way you, you go through and you prune as much as you can and then you spray just right after that. And so that's gonna um, prevent a lot of infection occurring on that opened up material. And so the two products you can use are Topsin M or Rally. Um, and you want, if you're gonna do it twice, I would use one the first time and use a different one the second time. So that way you're getting some rotation of your modes of action. If you're seeing any dieback, make sure to cut about eight inches down from the dead areas. So that's gonna make sure you're not, you're getting below where that infection is occurring. Another thing you can do is hedging. So this is gonna be more in the mid summer time. Um, and what this can, is, is that you're gonna cut the outer bands uh, about knee high. And this is going to increase the air circulation under the canopies because if it goes too far down, what you get is that, that it's just gonna block any air movement down there. Um, a lot of what I've heard from some growers is that if you get too high of cuts, um, you can decrease the sugar content 
Um, and I think one thing that Bill Klein was indicating in their the NC State webinar was that this is a pretty big concern on fresh market varieties. When we start getting into the processing varieties, it's not as much of a concern. These are the common uh, foliar diseases that we're dealing with. Uh, black rot, ripe rot, and angular leaf spot are probably some of the biggest ones, and ripe rot is what you would a lot of times refer to as anthracnose. And then things like bitter rot, macrophoma rot, and then especially powdery mildew, which um, we can lead to bronzing of a lot of the fruit. We're not going to go too much in depth in these, and we just don't have time to go through each one. But one thing we really need to harp on is a fungicide spray program. And what we all know is that muscadines are much more resilient uh, to pests than some of the grape varieties, especially when we're talking about European grapes. But we still need a fungicide spray program. And there's been a lot of research that showed that even baseline fungicide spray program, when people are just barely spraying, you can increase your yield and decrease the amount of disease a lot for making sure that you're keeping up with a good spray program. And the most important sprays of these are going to be your early sprays through bloom but you do need to be spraying every 14 days, even outside of that. So once you hit bud break all the way through harvest, you need to make sure you're getting a fungicide application out about every 14 days. One thing you need to think about while you're doing this because you are spraying so often is to rotate your FRAC group. So FRAC stands for the Fungicide Resistance Action Committee. So this is just a group, a committee that went in and designated the, diff the different ways that these fungicides actually kill diseases or uh, prevent the diseases from affecting. And so you want to make sure you're killing these diseases in different ways or they can involve resistance. Um, another way to do this besides just rotating them is combining mancozeb or captain with other chemistries. And so um, whenever you see an FRAC group that's like MO5 or MO4, these are the older fungicides like mancozeb or captain have been around for over 50 years. They have multiple modes of action. These fungicides are really good for controlling and preventing a lot of um, diseases, not generally uh, too well when compared with some of these other chemistries I'm gonna mention, but what they do is they offer a lot of disease pre um, resistance prevention, as well as pretty good efficacy of a, a wide range of diseases. So let's start first talk about bud break to bloom. Generally, you're gonna get about one or two applications in this time. Um, you can use something like Mancozep or Manzate um, or some of the other products that have Mancozeb in it. This is gonna be FRAC MO3, it's one of our older fungicides. Uh, the big caveat here is that it has a 66 day pre-harvest interval. For a lot of the processing varieties, it's not a big issue, uh, but for some of the fresh market varieties, you really need to watch when the last time you spray that is. Other options are Rally, which is FRAC 3, or Topsin, which are FRAC 1. And you also have the uh, options of things like your FRAC 11s, uh, like a Bound or Pristine, uh, but they're much more expensive and so it'd be you know, good to just go ahead and wait for those when they're gonna be more necessary, like in bloom uh, or just right after the bloom period. So bloom, you wanna make sure you're getting out fungicides every 10 to 14 days. You want to decrease to 10 days from 14 if you're getting a lot of rain in that time. Uh, Cat 10 is gonna be what you can use instead of Mancozeb here because you're probably within that 66 day pre-harvest interval now that Mancozeb has. Um, then Rally or Topsin are going to be good uh, options. And then also we'll add in, now is a great time to throw in a Bound, Flint, Pristine, or Sovereign. And so just making sure you get uh, at least one of these products every 10 or 14 days will get you a long ways in disease prevention. Post bloom and during harvest will get a little bit more complicated. We got all the same products. So you can see the different resistant groups listed there. But now we want to worry about more about PHI. And so especially when you're thinking about fresh market varieties, uh, you're thinking about harvesting um, every, you know, maybe every week or two weeks, you need to really think about the uh, PHIs. And so CAP-10 um, has a zero day pre-harvest interval, but it does have a 72 hour uh, re-entry interval. And so um, if you're harvesting every three days or more, then a spray of CAP-10, you won't have to worry about those intervals. But things like Rally or Bound, Flint, Pristine, or Sovereign, they all have 14 days. And so um, if you're looking to get a harvest out within 14 days and you don't want to apply these. Um, so you're going to base this a lot around when you harvest. Organic options are going to be sulfur and copper. Sulfur is really going to be your product of choice uh, for organic growers for prevention of uh, powdery mildew. And copper is going to give you some uh, level of control in all the rest. Um, there's a lot of other products that are, you know, bopping around out there, but uh, for the most part, these are going to be your two mainstays. Um, you go back, one thing I would mention is that um, I've heard a lot of people talk about the potential for sulfur and copper to burn plants, especially in the heat of the summer. Um, and so this is very different by variety. And so it would be worth your time to just spray one spot, uh, maybe some very small spot of the vineyard and just see how it reacts and see if you are getting any burn off that, especially in your different varieties. 
Um, another thing I heard mention or hear mentioned a lot is you know where you're getting your spray material to. And so this is like a fancy electrostatic sprayer on this like high density planting of grapes on these mounds. So don't pay too much attention to that. Really, all I want you to see here is that the spray material is being targeted to the underside of the vines uh, themselves and they're getting sprayed upward into the actual uh, berries there. And so you want to make sure that you're actually targeting your applications to underneath that uh, canopy. If you're driving through and you're just spraying an air blast and it's hitting the sides of uh, the leaves and stuff that are on there, a lot of that material is never going to make it into the grapes. And so make sure that you're thinking about that whenever you're, you're spraying, that you're trying to maximize targeting onto those berries as much as possible, especially when we're talking about fungicides. But even for a lot of our other um, pests, like our insect pests, also what you're wanting to do is target that. All right, and so the last thing we'll talk about here is insect management. Um, there's very few insect issues on muscadines that, uh, there's, you'll find a lot of insects out there, but very few you get to worry about too much. Um, you get a lot of them that feed on overripe fruit, so wasps and beetles, um, a lot of flies. A lot of times they're feeding on fruit they're not gonna harvest, or they're feeding on fruit that um, you know, aren't gonna be sellable. But the issue is that you get a lot of wasps out there and then maybe you know, your pickers don't, don't wanna be out there because you know, they're fear of being stung a lot. There are some options for controlling these, but in general, it's just not recommended. Uh, it's just another insecticide spray just to make you feel better about what's out there. Um, it goes a lot the same with defoliating insects like Japanese beetles. Um, if you're on the western side of the state and you have a ton of Japanese beetles, it may be worth your time spraying something like seven to get rid of them. But muscadines are very vigorous. And so a lot of times what they're doing is they're just kind of keeping some of your uh, fo foliage off. I mean, you do need leaves to make, you know, make fruit and make sweet fruit. Um, but, you know, they will get to a point uh, to where they could be getting too many leaves off. Great berry moth is uh, a concern for some growers. It's not as common of an issue on muscadines. We know with grapes, it's, it's a huge concern. Um, you know, for your muscadine plantings, I would use pheromone traps to determine the prevalence. Uh, if you're not really catching them out there to a high degree, that's because they're just really not reproducing out there every year. Um, the infestations usually begin around bloom, around May 15th or so, uh, just depending on the temperature for the year. Just get out and scout. If you're seeing them, then it's going to indicate that you're going to need uh, something to spray. And so I would check the, either the MP144 or the Muscadine, uh, Southeast Regional Muscadine I got on what to scout. Another insect that's pretty damaging is a uh, grape root borer. And this can be very damaging to vineyards. We know that from grapes, but also from muscadines. Um, in general, you want to get out and scout to see if you have this. I wouldn't recommend just spraying, um, you know, just, just in case. Check about 100 vines in each vineyard block. If you're finding about two on every 100 that are infested, then that means you're probably going to go to make an application of, of Lord's Band, which is the recommended um, material to spray. You would apply that in about a two foot or so band near the base of the plants. You don't want to contact any of the foliage material or anything like that. Um, but you want to treat before borers emerge. And so that means you want to get an application out about 35 days before harvest because the pre-harvest interval is 35 days. But even spraying after harvest, you will get some level of control. I've read some about mounding or plastic mulch. What I would recommend if you want to use this to say you're an organic grower is that you find someone who's using it and where it's working for them and figure out exactly how they do it because you, you don't leave the mounds on the whole time. It's placing them and removing them and I don't know enough about that to really tell you um, to do it safely. Mating disruption is another option. I believe it's organic. I googled around a while to try to find where it specifically said it was um, and I couldn't find it. Uh, but I know that a lot of mating disruption techniques are organic or OMRI approved. And what this is, is that you're putting out pheromone traps at such a high density, so at least 100 dispensers per acre, that the males and the females are going to have a hard time finding each other because they're following these pheromone trails. And if there's so much pheromone out there, they won't be able to find each other. Um, it's a very effective but expensive uh, technique. Um, some people have shown that it does work very well. And so if you're interested in that, I would look at what you thought 100 dispensers per would cost you. Uh, look at how much labor you thought that would take to do, um, and it's not going to be you put them out once and you go away. Um, I believe it's going to be something where you're going to have to figure out when these guys are coming out each year and then try to maybe put them out a couple times. And so it's definitely a good option if you're looking to not spray Lord's Band or if Lord's Band ever gets banned, which is potential, um, then maybe something you want to uh, look at. And so just to reiterate, um, try to maximize an integrated pr pr approach, which is trying to use cultural controls for the most part in muscadines. Um, you know, augmenting your environment to reduce pest risk and pressure, and then combine that with your weed management program to mostly just to maintain that breed free strip. 
um, a fungicide spray schedule, and then the insect management program that's going to be uh, based on scouting. So there, there's really no insects and muscadines that you're just going to spray, um, every, you know, every week for or on a schedule. Um, and there's my contact info below. If you have any questions, I'd appreciate it if you gave me a call or sent me a text uh, or just send me an email um, and I can try to get you the best answer you that I can. Thank you. So my name is Riley Mason and I am the wine grower for Rusty Tractor Vineyards. Um, I got hired on in 2016 and I've been in the industry since 2009. So I don't spray my muscadines. Um, they would be considered organic if not for uh, the proximity to my um, bunch grapes across the creek and the paraquat that I use to keep the uh, weed competition down. Um, other than that, um, I can tell differences in certain bridles. I grow about uh, 10 different bridles, four of which I know by name, the others I don't. Carlos and Noble do very well without being uh, sprayed. Um, they ripen very evenly, they're prolific in their crop. Um, Darlene does very well, um, but I do notice um, some rot on it a little bit, so it isn't as uh, productive, but it is worth it for the flavor to me. I make a rosé. Um, I harvest everything and put it in the bin and I typically give it about 24 hours skin contact if I don't process that day uh, so it draws that red color out but um, I ferment everything together in one pot and crush press immediately um, so I use uh, Noble, Carlos, Darlene, Ison, um, and the other varietals that are out here. So most people are used to a super sweet muscadine. I, I actually prefer a dry muscadine but um, our clientele definitely wants it a little bit sweet. Um, so we do um, a little bit sweet muscadine. It's not as sweet as most, um, but it's definitely sweeter than some. All right, everyone. So we're gonna move into our question and answer session. You'll notice down at the bottom of your screen, there's a little box that says Q&A. And if you click on that, that is where you can enter your questions and we'll do our best to try and get to as many of them as we're able to. So we're gonna invite our speakers to join us with their video on uh, and um, unmute themselves. And we've already had a few questions um, start to come in. And we're gonna just kind of go around and, and refer those questions to you um, as they came in. So again, thanks so much, uh, Margaret, uh, Mark, and Aaron for joining us here tonight. Um, we appreciate you taking some time out during this busy time of year to, to share your expertise. So Mark, the first question that came in um, is for you, and it's uh, relating to a little bit more about the North Carolina industry. Um, and the question is, is what are the most commonly planted fresh market cultivars in North Carolina? Well, thank, thanks, Amanda. Um, so the, the most common fresh market cultivars in, in our region are, um, we, we have a larger plantings of Supreme, which is very common in, with us, it's a, it's a high producer. It has a lot of problems though, um, with uh, cold damage and it can overbear and, and come, come out early and gets a lot of damage to the later years. So we see that a lot in Supreme, but Supreme is one of the larger producers here. Terra and Triumph are large producers as well. We have Hall, we have Late Fry, so those would be like the large, um, I would say that out of the top of my head, those would be the, the, large, the, the large producers here. We have a little bit uh, of um, ice in as well and some, and some smaller uh, vineyards. And, uh, yeah, and with, actually with one large producer as well. Great, yeah. thanks Mark. Mm -hmm. um, and then Margaret, there was a question that came in for you um, about the cotton candy grape and the availability of those vines. Can you comment on, on that for us? Yes. Well, cotton candy, I will mention, is not a muscadine. That is a bunch grape. But um, cotton candy was developed in a collaboration with a private company. And so they actually have the rights and they want to control the availability and the price on that. So it's a club variety. And they have 
really intense controls on who can access those vines and they have to sell them back to the company that owns it. So it's not something that everyone can just buy to have in their yard or in their own vineyard for um, a production vineyard. However, uh, you know, you'll see it in grocery stores quite frequently. So it is available to those who want to eat it, but not to just small growers who would want to grow it. Thanks, Margaret. Sure. And then Erin, we had a question for you about spotted wing drosophila um, and whether or not it is an issue in muscadine or other grapes. Yeah, thanks. Um, so spotted wing drosophila is very limited by the thickness of the skin of the berries that's going to infect or be able to lay eggs in, which is how it causes damage. So I believe even grapes, they're not going to be able to do too much of a job to. And so muscadines especially, they're really only going to be able to infest the ones that are injured in some way. And so you can probably just kind of add those in with the rest of the fruit flies that you're going to have issues with. But um, in general, damage is going to be what causes them to uh, allow some kind of infestation. Great, thank you. We just had a question come in about the name and location of the breeding program in South Georgia. And I believe that um, Patrick Connor is the grape breeder and the location is the Tipton campus. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, we had a question about kind of some economic uh, numbers uh, for muscadine production. Is there any of that data in the um, uh, production guide? Uh, yes, so we have ballpark numbers per acre for the first uh, couple of years of establishment and for a typical management year. Um, it's not a complete budget, but it's, a, it's very close to complete budget. It's a ballpark number. Uh, thing and, and most of our uh, authors looked over that and confirmed, including the growers, that that is kind of what we're looking at. Great. Well, that's a great resource. Um, and then Margaret, would you be willing to tell us a little bit more about the uh, selection that you made recently? Uh, anything about their fruit quality or, or what's unique about it? Oh, our our new seedless? Yeah. <laughs> well, I've, I've known this selection for one week, so very little is known about it. It's just an exciting new development in our program, something we've been looking forward to for a long time. You know, I think for the fresh market muscadine industry, um, it's been hard to differentiate a superior product. So you have a lot of variation in the texture and the flavor of these different varieties that are out there. However, they're all sold as black or bronze, you know, muscadines or scuppernongs. And so you could have something really good with a nice texture like Supreme that is being sold and, you know, have that for one week and then have it replaced with something like Nesbitt that has a more shoe leathery texture. And so how's the consumer gonna know that you have something better on their hands? And so I think seedlessness is a real opportunity to transform the industry, to have higher quality standards and a new product that's gonna draw more consumers. So we've just been really psyched to get started working with uh, seedless muscadines for a while now. And, and, that, and that brings up, a, someone just asked another question on the, on, uh, the Q and A here. To, me, to you, Margaret, if successful on seedless muscadines, will it still be called a muscadine on the market? Well, that's a good question. That's largely gonna be determined by the marketers. I know that there's been some discussions with Rasmataz, the first muscadine release is now being marketed as vine drops. So um, instead of a muscadine, cause I, they want to market it to beyond the Southeast where anyone's ever heard of a muscadine. And so they want, a sexy new name uh, to attract everyone. So I'm not sure what they'll do with the next generation of seedless muscadines that bear more resemblance to a muscadine because Rasmataz, the first generation, really to me is like a little champagne grape. It's not much like a muscadine, but for every generation moving back, the newer selections, they look more like muscadines. So I can't say too much about our new selection yet. And it will be you know, I would say five years at least until we have a, an Arkansas seedless muscadine that's on uh, the market. But we're really excited about this development. I think it's going to be great for the industry. But I do agree with you. I do think that we are seeing a trend with fruit in general, where, you know, we used to see grapes were either red or white, right? But now we are seeing names because they want that name recognition. And I think in the marketing of breeding programs, that that is, that is going to be key for the future of success of, of whatever releases we have coming out. 
That's true. And muscadines, it's funny, it's a name that is polarizing, right? So I love muscadines and I get so excited about them, but I know there are people out there who are not as sophisticated as me who don't have nice palates and don't like them. And so, you know, some people think that the name muscadine would come with some sort of baggage, but it also comes with a nice association of, you know, something that people grew up eating and a nice Southern fruit. So I think it could go either way, but I'll let marketers who are smarter than me about what consumers want <laughs> make that decision. All right. Well, we are getting close to the top of the hour. So I'm going to let you all know that we are going to have a final poll that will pop up on your screen. And if you'll help or complete that poll, that will help us out a lot. It just gives us a little feedback about these kinds of events. And if you want to see future webinars, um, uh, as we move forward. Um, we do have a few more questions. So if, if our panelists are willing to stay on for just a few more minutes, we'll, we'll try and get to these last couple of questions. Um, next question, Erin, is for you, um, asking about uh, organic production and if uh, the spray program would, how your spray program might change if you were, were producing muscadines organically. Okay, yeah, the big difference is just going to be, you know, more heavily relying on cultural control uh, but the, the sprays that you really have available that are really known to, to have some efficacy are going to be sulfur and copper. But, um, you know, hitting the right timings that I talked about before and trying to make sure you're getting something out early is always going to be uh, the same, even in organic versus conventional. Um, but, you know, I've, I've read some things about, you know, wanting to limit your sprays maybe 30 days before harvest. Um, and some of the muscadines, and I'm not sure exactly what the difference in fresh market and, um, and processing is for that. But, you know, relying on copper and sulfur is going to be your main deal, but also making sure you get it out from bud break through flowering, especially. Okay. And then Renee, we have one last question. I don't know if um, anybody wants to comment on this or not, um, but anybody want to discuss the difference between a muscadine and a scuppernog? I'll let Margaret take it. Oh yeah, okay. Scuppernong is the original bronze cultivar of muscadine. So it was a wild selection that was made um, in Manio in North Carolina down by the beach there and they still have the original vine, this big old gnarly thing growing there. And so oftentimes people will call anything that's a bronze muscadine a scuppernong, but that is incorrect. Uh, Scuppernong is the name of a very specific, very old bronze fruited muscadine that's the source of the bronze trait for everything that we grow now. So Scuppernong is in the pedigrees of a lot of things that we're using now. Renee, do you see any other questions coming in? No, I see a comment from someone asking if anyone else has planted oh my in Arkansas that one of, a, a grower is actually trying it um, and to see how it's going to do in Arkansas. So it's the first I've heard of someone planting oh my in Arkansas. So that's interesting. So, and then one of the, one of the panelists does ask us about mechanization and we didn't talk a lot about, uh, you know, mechanization, um, you know, for, for fresh market, you know, uh, still that's going to be a lot of hand operation, most likely, um, uh, particularly if we want to have a post harvest element uh, to the storage of the, of the muscadine, because a lot of damage can occur during a me mechanization process. I think that wraps up our questions tonight um, and we want to again thank our speakers for sharing their, their uh, wisdom with us um, and this webinar is being recorded so we will send out that the link to the recording um, hopefully within the next day or two um, and we thank you all for joining us tonight and we look forward to seeing you again at a future webinar. Have a good evening.